Today we are beginning a brand new series based on the lives and ministries of two of the most well-known prophets of the Old Testament. Their names are Elijah and Elisha. And I know they sound very similar, but they are two different people. And their stories are found in the book of Kings. And as you would expect, the book of Kings talks a lot about kings. And so the first 11 chapters uh, take a deep dive into the life uh, and reign of King Solomon. King Solomon was the son of King David, a very famous king. Uh, Solomon was considered to be the wisest king that ever ruled. Uh, he wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. He built the temple in Jerusalem. But when he died, his son Rehoboam took over. And during that time, there was a revolt. And then the kingdom was, from then on out, split into two, into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And as you continue reading through the book of Kings, you find out that it details how the kingdom, the northern kingdom, had done a nosedive spiritually. It, it had become horrible, and, and the people were running after false gods. And, and we're told that, and what we're going to look at today, is that Elijah comes on the scene during the time of the wicked king Ahab. Uh, during his, his reign, Israel had become a cesspool of idolatry. And he ended up marrying this horrible woman named Jezebel. She was the daughter of the king of the Sidonians. And this was obviously a political marriage, but it did not just impact Israel politically. It also impacted them spiritually because Jezebel introduced Ahab to the worship of the false gods Baal and his female counterpart Asherah. And the belief, the false belief was that these two gods were the gods of fertility, that if you prayed to them, your crops would grow and you'd have lots of babies. And, uh, and because of that, they also believed that Baal was the god of rain. So the people were turning their hearts away from God. And what you have to understand about the Lord God of the Bible is that he refers to himself. He actually gives himself a name. Now, I always knew that God was a jealous God, but I was reading uh, this week in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. You can check me out on this. But God said in Exodus 34, 14, my name is Jealous because I am a jealous God. So God calls himself that. Now, you might think, well, that's kind of petty, <laughs> right? Maybe you've had a, a jealous boyfriend or girlfriend, like, quit it, right? But imagine you're married, and, and, or, you know, there's a married man, and his wife is now dating some other guy. Uh, you would say, well, it's good and right for that guy to be jealous. Uh, vice versa, if, if the, a woman is married and her husband's cheating around, it would be good and right for her to be jealous of that situation. Well, God, in the same way, is jealous of his people, that he created us, he redeemed us, and when you and I start putting our hope and faith in things or people other than him, he becomes jealous in the, in the good sense of that he will do whatever it takes to draw you and me back into a relationship with him. Well, under the poor leadership of King Ahab and Jezebel, all the Israelites were running away, or at least the majority were running away from their relationship with God. And that's why he sent Elijah and Elisha to draw them back. And what we're going to find out throughout this series is that God is willing to do whatever it takes to keep you and me in a relationship with him. So to help us do that, we're going to dive into 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. It's printed out in your bulletin there, and I'll have it up here on the screen. So it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So right here what we have is the prophet Elijah confronting King Ahab about his idolatry, and he says that over the land there's going to be a nationwide drought. Now if you fast forward into the New Testament, in the book of James, we're given some details about this. It tells us that Elijah actually specifically prayed a curse upon his homeland. He prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. The big question, though, is why would someone pray a curse upon somebody else? And why would God answer such a prayer? But what we find all throughout the Old Testament is that God at times would take good things from his people to help them understand that he was the best thing that they had. Because oftentimes, and, and we do this too, is that we take good things and, and we love them or we're thankful for them, but then all of a sudden they become the best thing. They become an idol. And God, in his love, takes good things away from us so that we understand that he is the best thing. And you read through the Old Testament, as I was doing this study, God oftentimes would take away the, the spring and the summer rains that would cause droughts, that would cause famines, 
And his desire in causing this pain and discomfort was to get his people to wake up and turn back to him and go, oh my goodness, we're so sorry. His intent always was repentance, that they would turn away from their idolatry. Because as Jesus said in the New Testament, what good is it if you gain the whole world? What good is it if you have this comfortable life and yet at the end you lose your soul? And so Elijah's main concern for the people was not their comfort, it was their salvation. It was where their souls were going to go when they died. And so that's why he prayed this prayer to God, to curse the land for three and a half years. Now, personally, I love history. I didn't always like it. Um, I'm not a big fan of memorizing dates and places and names that have no relevance to my life. But when, when you look at history through the lens of how does that apply to you and me, it comes alive. And, and there are plenty of personal applications that we can glean from Elijah's story from what we've just uncovered thus far. Recently in our nation, we have been experiencing unprecedented droughts from the East Coast to the West Coast, from our northern border to our southern border. Normally here in Minnesota, this is the rainy season. Normally we should be out there mowing our lawn at least twice a week. Uh, but the last two years, we've barely had any rain. This is the second summer that uh, we've had extreme temperatures with little to no rain. On top of that, we have, uh, we've been blanketed in smoke from the Canadian wildfires, and not just here in Minnesota, but all throughout the United States. In fact, I, I read something that the smoke is actually reaching Europe at this time. Now, you can call it global warming. I think, I can't prove this, <laughs> but I think God is trying to wake us up. I think God is, is calling all of us to, to repent. And, and I know how easy it is right now to point fingers and say, well, if this party got their, their act together, we'd be fine and, and God would bring the rain again. Or if, if, if these people stopped pushing their agenda, then, then God would, would, be, would relent. But this is not the time to point fingers. It's not the time to, to blame each other. It's, it's the time for you and I, and I'm talking about myself here, is to look in the mirror and say, where are our priorities? Where are my priorities? Is my moral compass pointing in the same direction as God's moral compass. And if not, then we need to repent. And here's the beautiful thing about God, is that he promises all throughout the, his word that when he sends calamity and his people turn back to him, he relents. He welcomes us back with open arms. He says, I love you, I forgive you, and he restores the good things that he gave us before. When we get our priorities straight, that's his desire. That's what Elijah knew. Elijah knew that, hey, if, yeah, it's worth praying this prayer, this curse upon these people, because the, the goal is repentance so that they would turn back to God. That's why he would pray a prayer that ultimately would affect him personally. And, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But here's the thing. Maybe you've never done this before. But when you have a loved one who is turning away from the Lord, who is making idols out of good things and calling them the best thing, it's good and right, it's biblical for you to pray, God, now, before we pray this prayer, this is what you first have to pray. Lord, forgive me for all the times I've messed up, right? You got to look at your own heart. But it is okay for you to say, God, please take the good things that they have away. God, make their life difficult. I love them. I know you love them. But God, please take these things away so that they will see you, so that they will be, continue to grow in their relationship with you. Is that an easy prayer? Absolutely not. Have you, have you ever even thought about praying that prayer? You're like, you're crazy, pastor. Well, Elijah did it. You can do it too, okay? <laughs> so when you care about somebody, so often we're, we're more care, we, we care more about our you know, relationship. Are they going to be mad at me and whatnot? Who, who cares? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if, if they're not going to spend eternity with you in heaven. And so it's good and right at times to pray these prayers upon these people. And again, remember, Elijah isn't doing this out of spite. This is going to affect him personally. It's not like when everybody else is suffering from uh, lack of food that he's sitting high on the hog and he's eating banquets and everything. He's like, oh yeah, I can't wait for you guys to repent. No, this is going to affect him personally because he cared more about their souls than their personal comfort. But what we're about to read here is that as he prays this prayer, as God answers that prayer, God does not abandon his servant. God is with Elijah through these very difficult times just like God is with us. And sometimes God shows up in very unexpected ways, just like I showed the kids, but we're going to walk through this right now. Let's keep reading verse 2. 
It says, then the word of the Lord. Everybody say the word of the Lord. Now, the reason I highlight that is because in these 16 verses, you're going to hear this over and over and over again. And, and the importance of this, just so you don't miss it, is that God keeps his promises. So every time God speaks, maybe it sounds crazy, but he keeps his promises. So then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. Okay, we're going to hear lots of names of places, and they probably just, you know, hit you in the forehead and fly over. Uh, I'm going to show you a map just to give you an idea of what's going on. So this is all of Israel. Right here we have, anyone know the sea here? It's called the, that's the Dead Sea. That's the big one. Nothing lives in it, hence the name Dead Sea. It's a bunch of salt. Um, then you go up, and this is the Sea of Galilee. And I like how they label it here, Lake Galilee, because I've been there, and it's a lake. Like, we have bigger lakes in, in Minnesota than, than the Lake of Galilee, okay? So, Elijah, he's from Tishbe. He confronts Ahab in Samaria. Now God says, I want you to go to the Kerith Ravine or the brook. So he travels just north of where he grew up. And eventually, we'll get to this a little bit later, he ends up in Zareph. Zarephath, sorry. So that's where he's going to be. So this is what's going on. And so God says, go to this place. And he keeps going. He says, you will drink from the brook. And I have directed, read it with me, the ravens, not the football team, the birds, to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So, there's about to be a drought. When there's a drought, there's not a lot of water. God says, I got a good place for you. Go there. I'll provide for you. Why does he need to leave, by the way? Well, remember, Ahab's not a good guy. And as soon as this drought starts to kick in, he's not going to like Elijah very much. So Elijah needs to get out of Dodge because his life is going to be in danger. So God provides for him a place to stay, lots of water. And then on top of that, he says, and I'm going to send you ravens to bring you meat and bread twice a day. Like this is the first rendition of DoorDash, but it was free of charge. Pretty awesome, right? And it worked really well. And, and, and what's crazy about ravens is they're scavenger birds. These are birds that you see constantly eating roadkill. I know that's not a fun visual, but that's what you see them doing. They are birds of op opportunism. They will um, take food from another animal. These are not the caring, sharing kind of birds. And so you kind of wonder, why didn't God send like a, a carrier pigeon or a falcon? Those things, I mean, historically we know those things bring things to people, right? Those birds are, are, are good and kind and, and they'll do what you tell them to do. But, but ravens? Now it doesn't specifically tell us, but... You glean from this that God can use anything, anyone, anybody to take care of his people. And that's what God's doing here for Elijah. Now, normally God works through the normal means. God gives us our talents, our abilities. He gives us jobs and careers. You work hard, you get a paycheck, you go shopping, you eat food. Some of us are in, in situations where we have to rely on local or, or government agencies to help us to make it from one day to the next. But sometimes those normal means don't cut it. Sometimes they're taken away. Maybe you get injured on the job and, and now you have to apply for a disability. Uh, your hours are reduced. You get fired or laid off. Uh, maybe the government program that you were depending on is defunded. Or the food pantry that you were frequenting is, is no longer providing food. Uh, maybe you made a bad investment, and now your, your money's gone. Or you made a bad decision, and you blow all your money at the casino or the racetrack. Now what? And this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're single, divorced, married, married with children. Uh, this is stressful. It's overwhelmingly scary. And, and the normal human reaction is to worry. Trying to figure out what to do next in a seemingly impossible situation can be paralyzing. Maybe you're in that situation right now. Maybe someone you know is, is going through that in this moment. More than likely, you will experience this down the road if you're not going through it right now. So what do you do when you don't feel like you have enough to make ends meet? Well, what did Elijah do? He relied on the Lord. Elijah was a man of prayer. And what a lot of people don't understand is that prayer is a two-way conversation. 
I, I call people all the time. They haven't been to church in a long time. Say, hey, how you doing? Like, I'm doing great, Pastor. I started praying again. Great. You're in your Bible? Nope. So you're just talking to God, but you're not letting God talk back to you? It's a two-way conversation. See, in the book of Hebrews, it says, the Lord spoke to his prophets like Elijah in various ways and various times, but today the Lord speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And 99% of the time, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to us through his written word, the Bible. And so if you're in a situation and you want God to speak into that situation, what you need to do, sit down, grab your Bible, and start reading it. Pour over that. And how many of us at, you know, and a lot of people are like, well, I don't know how to read my Bible. We just did a series on that. I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that. But Sometimes, it's, how many of you have ever sat down, popped open your Bible, and all of a sudden, boom, there was the right verse you needed at that moment? Raise your hand, if that's ever happened to you. Isn't that amazing? You're like, what? <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit. God speaks through his word to his people. And God and Elijah are having this conversation, and God says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to send you to the right place where you need to be at the right time. I'm going to take care of you. Now, the way I'm going to take care of you may not seem logical, may not have been your plan or, or the way that you would have devised this, but God was taking care of Elijah. It wasn't super overabundance, but it was what he needed when he needed it. And what's neat is that Elijah said, okay. Like, I, I don't think Elijah doesn't tell us, but I assume he, he never ever experienced DoorDash by ravens prior to this. Oh yeah, that's cool. I've used that in the past. No, like this is a brand new scenario for him. And he says, all right, Lord. And he went. And because he did, he was blessed for it. When you find yourself in need, I know how stressful it is. I know how easy it is to go into fix-it mode and say, all right, what do I do? How do I finagle this? How do I make this work? Instead of doing that, instead of trying to carry that burden on your own, I'm just going to plant this seed in your mind. Let the first thing you do is pray. Say, Lord, I need your help. And then trust that he's got a plan for you. Again, it may not be the one that you would have chosen. It may not seem logical at all. But it will be what you need when you need it. And as we're about to read, this isn't a one-time thing. You all know, if, if you're older than a teenager, <laughs> you've, you've gone through situations where like, oh my gosh, how are we going to make it? And then you made it through, you're like, whew. And then all of a sudden, there's another time, oh, how are we going to do this? And then you made it through. And all the time, we got to go back to the Lord and say, now what? How can you help me? What do you need? What's the plan? And that's exactly what happens to Elijah here. So sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then, read it with me, the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Remember who I said is from Sidon? Do you recall? Jezebel. So go to Zarephath in Sidon where they have all, the, that's where the, the false teachings you know, originated from. This is a bad place. This is where your enemy's wife's Family lives, go there. Does that seem like a good idea to you? Would you jump up and go, yes, Lord, send me, send me? And then he says, and I've directed a widow to take care of you. Now here's the tomfoolery of that. That's a fun word. Widows were, were less reliable than ravens back in the day. Like they were the poorest of the poor. There were no government um, agencies taking care of them like we have today. Like, it was better for him to get fed by ravens than the Lord to say, hey, I got a widow for you. Like, he wouldn't have jumped for joy and go, woohoo, that's great. Like, that, this is not a five-star Michelin chef that he's, that's going to be feeding him. This is a very poor, poor, bottom of the rung person. And, and you'd think maybe, maybe Elijah would push back. God, are you sure? Like, this does not sound like a great plan, God. But what does he do? Read it with me. It's a short verse. So he went to Zarephath. Nowhere does it say that he questioned God. Nowhere does it say that he debated with him in that moment. Nowhere did he say, this isn't logical that you're sending me into er enemy territory. He just went. And why do you think he went so confidently? 
What did he just experience? God said, go to the ravine, and there was water. God said, I'm going to send you ravens to feed you twice a day, and the ravens fed him twice a day. So when God says, hey, go to this place, and there's a widow, and she's going to feed you, he's like, all right, <laughs> sure, doesn't make sense to me, but you kept your promise last time, Lord. The word of the Lord was good, so it's going to be good this time around. See, what, what we all need to do when we're in need, and, and, I, and I did this this week as I was prepping for this, is think back and ask yourself, when did God take care of me the last time I went through something like this? And bring it to mind. And remind yourself, oh yeah, well God helped me through that and that was really bad. That was way worse than this situation. Oh yeah, God did that. That was really cool. Oh yeah, is God going to get me through this? Well yeah, he loves me. He provides. Why am, I, why am I doubting? Does that seem weird that he'd send me there? Yes, absolutely. But, you know, he's done weirder things in the past. So he, he's got that firm example in his mind. He says, I'm going. Now, again, is God always going to provide for us in abundance? Hmm. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer what? Give me this day my daily bread. If I'm not hungry today, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's all good. Right? He went, just like we can go. And he says, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. Imagine that. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me please a piece of bread. So there she was, just like the Lord said, and he asked very politely for some bread and water, which doesn't seem like a big ask, right? And this is her response. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar, and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Do you remember what God said to Elijah? I have a widow ready to go to feed you when you get there. Is she aware of that plan yet? <laughs> she has no idea. And Elijah just fully asked her, hey, can I have some food? She says, this is my last supper. It was in her mind, in her heart, she and her son were going to starve to death. And so this is what he says. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. I should have highlighted that, because that's good words, right? Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first... Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. Are you cringing in your seat right now? You're thinking, what a jerk. <laughs> like, this is her last meal. But hook me up first, lady. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Now here comes the promise of the Lord. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So the widow says, I'm about to make this final meal. I'm going to die. Elijah says, okay, don't be afraid. Make sure you make me something first. And what is he teaching her? The first fruits principle. In, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about worrying. It's one of my favorite passages because I was Mr. Worry Wart. And in that, he says, why do you worry about tomorrow? Tomorrow has enough problems of its own. He says, why do you worry about what you're going to eat or drink? He says, your heavenly father is going to take care of you. And then he says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, food, clothing, shelter, will be provided. And so in this moment, he's saying, put God first. And here's the promise. That jug of yours, it's not going to run dry. That jar will always be full. Now think about it. This woman has nothing to lose, right? Either way, if he eats first or second, in her mind, she's dying. But she has a decision to make at this, this moment. Trust in God's crazy plan 
or go with her plan. And this is what happens. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Isn't that cool? Now, it is awesome, Elijah's faith and his faithfulness, that he's willing to go wherever God tells him to go. It's amazing that this widow and in, in, in her moment of distress, says, all right, I'm going to do what the Lord says and, and, and just try it out and see what happens. And, but what I want you to walk away with today is that our Lord, the God of Elijah, the, guy, the God of that widow, keeps his promises. Every single promise in the Bible is yes and amen. <laughs> it is good that we can rely on that, that we do not have to worry in, in the midst of our necessities, that our God is going to provide for us. Your God is going to provide for you. And how do I know that? Because God provided the greatest gift that all of us need. Not only have we come in here with a necessity to fill our bellies and to make sure that, that we have a home to stay in, but we all have come in here today and listening online, we've come here with, with a necessity of, of removing our guilt and shame. And clearly in God's word, it tells us that God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to take away your sins and mine. To take away all the times that we have relied on our own know-how and, and said no to God's plan. Jesus Christ says today, I forgive you. He provides that forgiveness. And on top of that, he provides you with your daily bread. Every single day. Again, is it always going to be an overabundance? No. <laughs> but when you pray, God, provide, he will. And don't be picky about what he gives you. Like, well, that's not what I was hoping for, Lord. No, say, just say, thank you. <laughs> you gave me what I needed when I needed. And as I was thinking about this, you know, the Lord has, has provided for me, and I, I could go on and on and on. We, we're coming to our end, so I can't. But as, as I think about how the Lord has provided for me, I, I was just... Last night I was in tears, just thinking about these last couple years. Um, some of you know this, some of you don't. My, my wife and I and our kids, we foster children. Uh, we have two foster babies in our house. We got licensed about 10 months ago, and about a month into the process, we, we saw online that there were these two babies available that, that needed a home, a five-month-old and a 10-month-old, a 15, five and 15-month, brother and sister, very close in age. And uh, my wife and I look at each other like, Okay, let's pray about this. <laughs> like, God, this is your will, you know, open our home. And, and so we called the agency and said, yeah, we're, we're willing to open our home. And I said, all right, we'll come and get them. Now, here's some backstory. We've never done this before. <laughs> we, we don't have cribs. We don't have car seats. We don't have high chairs. We don't have diapers. We don't have wipes. We don't have clothes. We don't have toys. We don't have nothing. And they're like, come get them. <laughs> we look at it like, oh my gosh. It was one of those moments, right? And we prayed, like, Lord, help us. <laughs> and he did. Our neighbor next door brought over pack and plays and high chairs. And just here, they're, they're yours. Uh, she brought over a double stroller the same night. Um, I don't remember how God provided us with car seats, but we got car seats in the car. Um, God used neighbors friends from church, complete strangers I've never met before. He said, I will provide. It's amazing <laughs> that these, you come in here and you listen to these stories, like that is, that can't happen. But it happens every single day. And if you're in that moment of like, God, where, where are you? I need you, I need I need provision. Today, your homework is on your, in the car. Where, you know, if you're driving by yourself, just meditate. Like, you know, think about, where, God, where have you shown up in the past? If you're driving home with somebody, have that conversation. Like, where, where has God shown up in our lives recently or, or you know, years ago? If you're at home on, online and, and you shut this down, talk with the person next to you and just rejoice in that your God has not left you. And if, if we think about it, we have way more than we need, right? 
But God has not left us. God has not abandoned us. He is faithful to his word. Just like he was to Elijah, and just like he was to the widow, God is faithful to you. Let's pray. God, I'm sorry that I complain so much when you've given me so much, Lord, that day in and day out you provide for me in ways that I'm not even aware of, that you're working behind the scenes to make sure that I and my family are well taken care of. God, bless all of us. Help us to have that mindset of contentment, of faith, that trust that you will provide, no matter the circumstances. Uh, Help us to go throughout our lives with open hands, willing to receive, but also willing to give back to those that, that need. Because God, you've used so many times, not ravens and widows necessarily, but you've used people, friends, neighbors, complete strangers to bless us. And so God, help us to do the same for others. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray all these things.